And good evening and a very warm welcome into the breakdown. Tonight we come to you from Hotapu Rugby Club in Cambridge, New Zealand. It's the home of the Jacobson brothers, Tawara Kerbalo. And this guy here, here he is, Liam Meeson. How good is it to be at your club? Kia ora, no, good to be home, good to you be home. bring anyone along with you? Sure did, brought my uh, Uncle Wayne with me uh, tonight. <laughs> Uncle Wayne, Wayne Smith, Wayne that Smith. is the guru. Chelsea Alley's also here, let's get inside. Koto Kato, hello and welcome. We are in Cambridge, yes, Hotapu Rugby Club, and it's a privilege to be here. Of course, now that the Chiefs are on a roll, back to back wins in Super Rugby, Aotearoa, and maybe pushing on towards semi final time in a few weeks. Fantastic, usual, usual suspects here on the breakdown Sir John Kerr and Mills Muleyena, but all black number 10 8 2. There he is. Well, that's a younger version of 10 8 2. There's the older version. Ready for the over 35s at the rugby club. Nice to be yeah, back. Battle uh, of the bridge. Absolutely, the battle of the bridge, yeah. We'll show you that a little bit later on. Fantastic, uh, look, defending champions of the club. I mean, how important's this club been for you, Liam? Yeah, this is uh, the club where I first started. Came up from uh, Rotorua to here to Hamilton. Um, and there's some old familiar faces here that spent a lot of time with me and, and um, nurtured me. Um, some players also taught me some bad habits, but also some good habits, but uh, it's an awesome club, a very family environment club, and I just really love my time here in, in the red and white hoops. An important part of the community game, uh, club rugby, but if we think about the highest level, uh, have you worked out which side you're on now? Uh, after the weekend, you, you picked the Blues by how many? Hey, and, uh, on, man, oh, yeah, on, I know, man. before the game, hey, but reality is, uh, have you picked the side of the fence now? Oh, man, I was always Chiefs, you know that. Well, hey. Not a, hey, we'll get to the tipping competition a little bit later on, and the truth will come out, but JK, for you, I can't believe you're smiling. Yeah, I know, it's been a hard, hard few days, to be fair, but all of us in Auckland felt there was a forward pass. <laughs> Anyone north of the Bombays, you know? Thought it was a forward pass, to be fair. No, You're the only person important. in this room that thinks that. <laughs> the only I person know. that thinks that. But and we didn't what. detach from them all, but uh, what, a, what a great game of rugby. That's what I loved about it the most. I mean, obviously, D-Mac, like, how good was he late? And I think the Chiefs, you know, we were talking about it before. Oh, Angus, Angus will live on this forever, Liam, because... Actually, oh, he's on that down. yeah, exactly. Because if you if you don't slow him down there, he's got beautiful, beautiful feet. Th so. This is who did it better, and that's what we're playing because the number of covering tackles on the weekend, and then you think about Jordy Barrett Mills, the fact how good he was. Thirty points on his own, he beat my Highlanders. That's just mean. That's all I can say about that. But this is remarkable. Not able to finish, but I tell you what, he's on top of his game. Yeah, textbook, wasn't it? That 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 tackle he had to be able to cover and a low tackle as well. But 30 points, gee, is that greedy now for fullbacks, isn't it? Far out. <laughs> well, a little bit greedy, but I can tell you what, credit where credit's due, this is probably the best one, mess, isn't it? And it wasn't even, it's a, he's going to be yeah. a rugby player. Yeah. He's going to be doing this one. maybe for your Blues next year. Roger to oh, a bus, a shek. That's a try-saving tackle. Look at this. How good. Top but, eight, here we come. But the thing that amazes me at this level is the awareness. Like, he dived for the arm. You know, that things are going at pace, and just the accuracy and the vision they've got, that's incredible. But also, the, all those three tackles were different. You know, Damien McKenzie had to go high to try and stop Mark Tillier. He's knocked him over. Uh, you know, Geordie Barrett going low, the awareness to be able to cut him short, and then, you know, Roger being able to, you know, go for the ball in that, that instance. So the skill set amongst these players are extraordinary. It could be the Warriors' year. I'll tell you what, those are try-saving tackles. <laughs> hey, 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 it could be the Warriors' year. Try saving tackles, I'm going to show you a try. From the very first club that we went to this year, we went on the road and it was the Harbour Club and Port down in Dunedin. Just watch this. Outstanding play. Oh. Falcon, off the guy going off. That cannot and be allowed. That's, in Dunedin, that's definitely allowed. That's the try of the year. Try of the year from Dunedin, the great people down at the Harbour Rugby Club. Well, after the weekend, how have things changed in Sky Super Rugby Aotearoa? Nothing's changed at the top. The Crusaders had the bye, and they are well and truly clear, but things are very, very different. With the Chiefs getting up over the Blues, the Hurricanes over the Highlanders, everyone now 
considerably in the contest. They are there, they can be a part of, I suppose, the playoffs going forward. That's what you're chasing now, that opportunity to get to the Crusaders. We are halfway through the season. It's time now to go to the report cards on where these teams are at. We're going to start with the Blues, which means we start with you, JK. Given the fact they've last, lost their last couple on the bounce, where to from here, what needs to change? Oh, look, I think on the weekend the biggest thing for the Blues supporters was probably the leadership on the field. Um, if you look a couple of times, you see Tana running, running out Mills with the, with the kicking tee. And I don't think you can let a, a team like the, the Chiefs stay close. So I thought a bit of... Last year we said, is this the closest thing to test rugby? And it sure is. And I just think with the quality of the opposition, you've got to take your points, keep kicking. I think they've been um, shaky in the last couple of weeks, but there's still a pretty good nucleus there, but they do need to recover because teams are coming back with confidence. Mears, when you look at the Blues and you saw them firsthand on the weekend here in Hamilton, where do you think they need to make some improvements if they're going to challenge, not to finish second, but take on a Crusader side that clearly at the moment have got the rest of the team on notice? Yeah, well, talent-wise, you look at their talent compared to the Chiefs and individually they probably had the, the more talent on the field. Um, just the intensity, just sort of the Chiefs boys got up, you know, they had the, their first win and their whole attitude just changed and um, I just felt that the, the Blues didn't match the intensity that the, the Chiefs boys came out in. A number of players who have impressed though, the likes of Adult and Papa Lee Mills who have come out and, and shown that when they do get an opportunity and they can stay healthy, they can make a difference. And Look, he's bringing it in every week but they're going to need more of this in the back end of this competition because this sprint is getting very, very short very quickly. He was very good in the weekend, Dalton Papa Lee, in terms of you know, getting over the ball, he was hungry, he's enthusiastic. You've spoken about it before, JK, you know, what he brings. But they, they need a bit more than that, don't they? And I almost think uh, it has to come from the backs. I think they need a bit of, bit of direction in, in the backs in terms of someone that's going to absolutely lead from the area. You've got Patrick Tuipolotu. He's always going to bring that physicality. You know, Dalton here brings something a little bit different. But I think where they're actually really lacking, and perhaps it's first five, all Teddy Black seem a little bit quiet these last couple of weeks. I wonder whether he's, you know, carrying an injury because they just, they just sort of lack that, that direction um, when it comes to the tough moments. Well, they were ahead in that game, though, until the 78th minute, the 79th minute. We shouldn't forget that, the fact that they'd done enough to probably win the game. They just couldn't quite close it out. So we move on to the Chiefs. And where they are right now, and Liam, you've seen that change. You've seen them win those back-to-back -back games. How significant is that, and where have they improved to the fact that they can push on? Oh, it's huge for them. Just their confidence has, has changed. Um, Clayton said it was a, a monkey off their back, but Sir JK said it was a, a big... Gorilla, or big ape off their back. So just the weight that just come off them and they, they're just playing with freedom now. And um, what I loved about the weekend was just the intent, the intent and everything they've done, their tackling, their cleaning, their ball carry. Like Quincy Pyle was, he was, he was the man on a mission. He was just making meters at will. Um, so just the confidence that they've had just by winning a game. <laughs> My player of the day was a front rower. Angus and you don't up. know why. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know why, but what I do know is that the Blues came down with a reputation that they had this amazing scrum, they've got All Blacks on the bench out there, and Angus is obviously a, an All Black, but he went out there and the scrum was, mm. was outstanding. And then he gets across to make that cover tackle, which we're having a bit of a joke about, but he cut down that angle so that Dalia had no footwork. I mean, those little things are amazing, and that's the sort of stuff you want from your older statesmen, your leaders, and I thought he was outstanding in, 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 you know, the scrum. And you get that sort of parity in the tight five, all of a sudden you see the best of their loose forward trio. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not just a loose... I mean, you spoke about Quinton uh, Tapai out, out wide, but when you see parity, you know, um, up, up front, you know, because re realistically, the, the Blues had a, a much better... For, well, a bigger pack. But, you know, Jacobson and co, they start going to work as well. I mean, they've become an influence, you know. You've got to, um, you know, you, all of a sudden you've got to, um, you know, consider them. And so it starts to open up a little bit. You know, he's been a little bit quiet out, out in the ages, and, you know, before the Hurricanes game. But now his running game, a beautiful pass here, was absolutely <laughs> back, wasn't it? And they score a try. No doubt about it in my mind, Mills. I'm 100% <laughs> with you. Look, Jacobson, he's a local boy as well here. And Look, when you talk about teams and you talk about sides that have got some momentum and needed it, look, the Hurricanes were 0-3 going down to Dunedin, uh, and then they come out, and Geordie Barrett starts doing some of this, JK, and this changes the context of any team with the ability to make big plays. Yeah, look, I think we've spoken all year about referees keeping people on side, but 
Guys like Liam, they're going to take a chance on the 50-yard mark to try and steal the ball and probably stay over it a bit more. You can't do that with Jordi out there. He's going to kick the ball from 50. And what happened was, I believe on the weekend, he gave the team confidence. He gave the opposition a big warning saying, stay clean, and they just got this massive roll-on. He was outstanding, but also with that roll-on, Hardy and the forwards were just keeping in the face, and I thought it was their best performance by far. Like, it's amazing, Hunger, Hunger the, 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 how much influence he has on a, on, a, on a team. You know, we've seen it last year when he came here uh, against the Chiefs, he knocked over that sort of goal, and then he started playing well. He goes down there, similar to the, you guys back in the days, you know, with yourself and, um, and Wax and that. But the influence he has on the Hurricanes is, is absolutely huge. Yeah, you know, anyone that can kick a ball over 50 metres, like JK said, you're, you know, you can have a massive influence. And just his ability with the ball in hand too, he's a, he's a big kid. He's like 6'3 or something, so he's not the smallest fullback running around. No, but he's made it quite clear he wants to be the all-black fullback. And I like the fact he has made that statement and the way that he approaches the game. I think it leads, and they needed leadership. Don't underestimate, too, Dane Coles coming back. I mean, you get that up front. Uh, he wasn't uh, at his niggly best, but I tell you what, he played some quality rugby and gave them some confidence. Well, the stats never lie. They don't lie. And we've got help here at Sky. We've gone to one of your own here from the club. He coaches your Colts team, your under-20 side. He's going to give us everything we need to know, Kirsty, about how the teams are playing in this year's comp. Yes, indeed he is, Tambay Matson. Thank you for opening the doors yeah. and welcoming us in. Yeah, you're welcome, Nissan Bula <laughs> and Kia ora tato. Um, fantastic. It's, fifth, it's round five. You know, they've played 320 minutes. Mm. It's a perfect time to have a look at the big picture numbers. They've got rid of the kind of pre-season glitches and their programs are kind of on track now. We're halfway through. So uh, one of the things I think that's fantastic we're seeing is all the teams are carrying the ball out of their uh, halves more. Mm. Uh, and so across the, across the competition, we've gone from pretty much 50% to 60% carrying the ball out of our halves. And that's great for us. You know, we're actually seeing exciting rugby, which is what we want to see. Um, most interesting, though, is, is looking at the programs that have shifted the most. So the Blues, who were one of the teams that kicked the most in their own half last year, have actually completely swung the pendulum. So, you know, last year you can see there 40% of the time they're carrying the ball. Now, 64% of the time, um, they're carrying the ball. So they're carrying the ball significantly more than they did last year. Uh, whether they realise it or not, this is probably the time in the season where you're looking at that and going, OK, Actually, was this the plan, or do we have to re-evaluate? And I think all teams will be taking um, kind of round five to rethink. There's also attacking efficiency. Can you explain to us what actually that is, first and foremost? Yeah, so attack efficiency is, if you're given a position, how likely are you to, to score points? And for me, that's a really important way to look at the game because um, it re relates directly to the scoreboard. And, you know, when you look at the red zone in particular, um, you can see the Crusaders are absolutely red hot. So 52% of the time, they are scoring points when they get into your 22. And for me, you know, last season, uh, they started off slowly. They were about, you know, 15% this time last year. To be at that level now is phenomenal. You can see these plays here. They get a line-out or a scrum in your 22. Um, they're, they're walking away with the points. So as Jeff said, the stats, the numbers, they don't lie. So what does this mean for the rest of the competition? Well, if the other four teams can't figure out a way of containing the air attack efficiency, you may as well give them the trophy now. Well, JK, what do you think wow. about that? Hey, he's called it. Well, there's a final this year. Anyway, the stats, loved them, thought they were amazing, but don't matter in the final. Uh, well, the, you've got your teams that get there first, but let's focus on the Crusaders. Let's go with that because... Can I focus on the Blues? <laughs> You're going to keep focusing on the Blues, and they're out of focus no, right now. No, that kicking stat. No, oh, why? It's called Bowden Barrett. Oh, <laughs> that's probably why. Well, maybe not. We'll talk about that another time. But let's talk about the Crusaders, because you try to avoid the subject, but they're difficult to play mess. You know how challenging they are. Um, when you look at them, this year it seems as though they've started this competition even further ahead than when they finished last year. Yeah, they play with a, a lot of pace, and um, yeah, they're just getting through their work like they, they always do. And uh, they've always been the the standard setter and, uh, and they're the same again this season. You think about some of the younger players, the likes of an Ethan Blackadder, uh, the impact they're having on uh, their team. And Mills, you look at them and, and do they show any vulnerabilities when you've got the likes of a Richie Moanga playing on top of his game? Well, it helps when you've got someone like that, don't you? I mean, uh, Tabo mentioned the fact, you know, they might as well give him the trophy, but the, he's a big influence, you know, in, in terms of, you know, he wins big moments, he directs the play very well and he got, he's got X Factor as well, you know, and, and it's... Um, you know, that's, that's part of their, well, I suppose, your backbone. He brings players like, you know, Will Jordan into play. They thrive off him. But 
also this, we've touched on that last week, the ability to get out and, and make those hard tackles when you've come from the other side of the field. So Maung is, you know, outstanding. I'll be interested to know sort of the, the stat in terms of how many phases it takes them to actually score because not only have they got world-class set piece where they score in under three sort of phases, but they also they're prepared to be patient as yeah. well. So, you know, the, the five-plus sort of phases or even possibly ten, you know, where they score off that, I think, you know, there's a bit of a mixture there. So, you know, how, how do you analyse them? I mean, we've got a man that's going to come up soon uh, who, who's very analytical. He might be able to tell us. JK, I mean, you look at their squad, you look at the way they play, do you see any weaknesses or the fact that is their biggest challenge the fact they're going to have to make sure they time their run and get themselves prepared for the right part of the season? Oh, no, I think, I think for them, I, I believe it's a one-horse race, so everyone just wants them to win now. Forget it. Fight for until second. the final, you're saying? Yeah, until the final, because it's a one-off game. To beat them in the one-off game, like Liam said, you have to be perfect across the park. I think a great side is 10 guys who have incredible work rate and four guys incredibly good work rate with talent, and that's what they've got. They've always got someone. If it's not, if it's not Richie stepping up, it's someone else stepping up at critical moments. Like, I was, I was at that Blues game, and they were out on their feet. And then Moanga just counterattacked from deep, and you can see the boys that are tired just lifting. And I think that you can't measure that in a stat. But you should enjoy it as well if you're a rugby fan. The not if you're way, from the Blues. Not mate. if you're from the Blues, but, but if you're looking for uh, the right way to play the game and the fact that you're seeing players develop and get better, and I think for me, they, they've set the standard and you should enjoy it. I'll tell you what I'm not enjoying right now is the way the Highlanders are going. Uh, look, it's a challenging couple of weeks. Uh, look, they got comprehensively beaten by the Blues. Um, the Hurricanes were really good on the weekend. So I, I sort of look at this, Mills, and I'm going, Tony Brown thinks uh, there's a possibility. He thinks there's a chance that they can get some momentum and, and, and find a way themselves in the playoffs. But they need things to change and change pretty quickly. Well, what better way to try and do it than against the Crusaders? Crusaders, <laughs> ideal, yeah. But, well, perfect. I mean, a tough one. But you've seen sort of how, this, how hard this competition is, you know, below the Crusaders. You know, you look at the Chiefs. They, they you know, lost their first two games. They've come back now two in a row. Momentum has all of a sudden has, has swung. The Highlands, it's a, a great win against the, the Chiefs. But now they're in a bit of a hole after the, after the, you know, the, the bye. I mean, so they're still very much in it, you know, um, in Bogey terms of the play they've got. Bogey team. <laughs> if they're going to lose against it. someone, it'll be the Hollanders. Uh, true. Because true. they've always struggled against the Hollanders. The Hollanders, it's a little bit like the, you know, the Battle of the Bombays. They love playing each other. And the Hollanders have got a really good record against them. For some reason, they just annoy them and throw them off their game. So if they're going to beat anyone, and how would that turn your season round? Well, you, you, well, you think about uh, the weekend had Shannon Frizzell scored early on in that game. That the momentum shifts in games and you get some going, uh, Miss. You think to yourself, they've got the talent on the field. Um, they've just got to realise it and, and give them opportunity. Yeah, it's the same thing with the Chiefs. It's, it's all about that confidence. Um, when they play with confidence, they're high on the team. They play quick rugby. Like they're they're um, really enjoyable to watch. Um, when the confidence down, they don't want to chance their arm a bit. They don't want to throw that pass or they start questioning themselves. Then, you know, doubt sets in and then... You know, they can slow you down. They won't quit. They'll keep fighting. They'll try and find a way to stay relevant and so well and truly in this competition. It's time now to go to Kirsty. One of my favourite parts of the show is to get a question from the crowd. What is it they want to know? Kirsty, what have we got? Yeah, well, there's been some great things to come out of Hotapu, especially these haircuts here. The mullet, this is where Damien McKenzie got it from. But also this man here, a local legend, Pat. Everyone's been telling us to come and talk to you. You've got Cambridge rugby referees on your sleeve. Are you still refereeing? I am. I certainly am. How long have you been doing that for? This is my 55th year. That's a long time. Active with me. Amazing. Now, you've got a question for our panel. Is it a hard one? Yes. <laughs> Who's going to be the next All Black fullback? Right. Well, we've shown a couple of guys, JK. For you, the guys are in form. Current form. Geordie. Why? What sets, him above, what sets points. him above somebody else? Well, 30 points, yes. Because at Test Match Rugby, you've got to do this. You're playing France, you're playing England, you're playing whatever. You can get your goal kicker to kick it from 50 yards. It puts the opposition on, on notice. Secondly, he is great at supporting in the second man role. And he's just an incredible player at the moment. You can't kick above him. You can't... Like, if you're an English team, you think, oh, I'll kick it and I'll compete in the air against Geordie. Nah, he's six foot three. So I just think he's on top of his game. He brings a complete game. And his X factor is he's got a boot. I mean, he kicked it from 50 and it went into the stand with all the scarfies. So, Liam, do you agree? I mean, you think about fullbacks and, and your expertise. The fact you've done a bit of time seagulling out the back there. Oh, We've seen it. You oh, know. I was hanging out the back with Millsy. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
oh, this is a bit of a hard question for me because I seeing well, no, seeing uh, Mac on, like, on Wednesday yeah. for a game of golf. So um, <laughs> 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 no, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Kirsty talked about the mullets. Well, both of them are rocking mullets, and uh, at the moment, D Mac's mullet is uh, outstanding. So um, now he's playing some good football and. At test level, like JK said, you just need the, the basics done well, but d can just bring that little bit of something special that I don't think anyone else can in the country at the moment. So, I just wanted to add that I think that we lost the World Cup because d couldn't come off the bench for us. So I would not... Like, he can come on for 20 minutes at the end and kill any side. He's the only guy at international level that I reckon he can really do that, so... There are other players in the conversation, though. It's not just down to two. There's a guy playing fullback for the Crusaders who's not so bad. Yeah, Will Jordan. I mean, we're, I mean, we're, we're, just, we're just so lucky to have so much talent, aren't we? The thing is, when you look at you, the all-black environment, when you go into the all-blacks, you just have to do your job. You know, that's, that's basically it. You win, you win your moment in terms of the position and what you do and what you do well. And, you, and you've got to do it at, at, you know, at, uh, at the very best. So when you look at someone like Will Jordan as well, he's bringing that, that X factor. He's got plenty of speed. You know, he's deceptively fast. You look at him, you think he's not going that, that, that quick, but, in, you know, he just, he just gets away on you. Um, so when you so look we at don't it, know. No, can we don't kick? actually. I mean, can, can Will goal kick? Uh, I'm not too sure. I think he has hit a yeah, goal I think kick. He has, yeah, he has. Yeah. Hit, I, think he, I think he can. And we didn't, do we need a goal kicker? Is no, I'm just saying it not could be the difference you? when you're selecting at that level, right? A long distance, yeah, to have that option. Uh, look, and you f shouldn't forget that David Harvelli, who's actually a fullback, is playing second 5'8 for the Crusaders. And I love the way that he plays his game. We get tested every week on the show. We've been on tour. It's time for trivia. This is challenging for us over the break. We get our minds together and see whether or not Kirsty can catch us out. What have you got tonight, Kirsty? I Kirstie? love being able to put you guys on the spot. And for everyone behind me as well, they are going to get involved. The trivia question tonight is, who was playing at number eight for the Chiefs when they won their title in 2013? Now, if Liam Messam doesn't get this, we'll be severely disappointed. Coming up after the break, Wayne Smith joins the panel as well. But in the meantime, sit back, relax. We're going to take you on a trip down memory lane when the Chiefs won their two Super Rugby titles. Now they get it wide, Williams! And Sonny Bill, Off he goes. under the post he goes! Oh. And the Chiefs are the champions in 2012. Messam wants to get his hands on it. Oh, he goes on his own! Here, Messam! Gruden sends the pass off, and here goes Robinson! Robbie Robinson! Rugby Club in Cambridge, New Zealand. Our favourite part of the show, the trivia question. If you missed it just before the break, it was who was playing at number eight for the Chiefs when they won their title in 2013? Liam, do you know who it is? Yeah, I'm sure it's uh, Maddie Van Leeuwen. Is, yeah, that, is that him? Yeah, nicely done. Played for the Tech Club up here too, so. Did you have any doubts? Yeah, I did actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was between two, because they're both battlers. It was him and uh, Kane uh, Thompson, so it was, I knew it was one of them. Great memories, though, when you look back at these moments and, and the titles here and, and possibly maybe this side could go that way in the future? No, it was awesome memories because uh, people didn't give us a chance. Like, most people not giving the Chiefs a chance now and we came up and, and shocked, uh, shocked the whole competition. Man, it was a uh, it was a uh, outstanding, outstanding squad, outstanding couple of seasons, of course, with the current Wallabies coach. And Wayne Smith had a little bit to do with that and he's joined the show. He's the... Current consultant with the uh, Waihi Athletic Club goes in some Thursdays, does some coaching over there. Can't help himself. I think every time you walk past the rugby field, right, and someone's practicing, you get a, a little wee itch, right? The fact that I could probably go and help. Is that still alive and well? I can tell you a story about that. I'm at Waihi Beach on holiday on a Saturday, and Smithy rings me and says, What are you doing? I said, I'm just chilling, mate. He says, oh, Do you want to come and watch Waihi <laughs> Athletic versus Fongamata? <laughs> And you oh, went? We had, no. <laughs> and he said, I'll pick you up in 10 minutes. And we went. We had a great day. You know, you can, you can still drink big quart bottles of Waikato Draft on the sideline. That's what, you, that's what he's celebrating. That's what he's celebrating. 
Men no, are no, no, men of the I'm people. The coaches. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With the coaches. Okay, if you're hoping the coaching, let's let's talk about rugby though. I mean, because you love to chat rugby. You've, you've seen what's happening in the game at the moment. Super rugby Aotearoa. You look at the contest. I mean, from your perspective, I mean, you're still well and truly connected in the game. When you look at it, what, what challenges you about it? What do you love about it still? Um, I I love seeing the game evolve. Um, you know, there's obviously going to be a bit of chat later about it devolving back 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 to the past a bit more um, for various reasons. But yeah, you know, I love I love seeing every year there's new stuff coming through in Super Rugby, and, and you talked about uh, the Crusaders there, and, and Tab I talked about their efficiency, and you know they're efficient in just about every area, and and that's what I really like about them. So uh, you know from their phase plays, they're quick into position, uh, they're in open doorways, um, they all come forward together. Um, they do the obvious quickly, you know, if a gap opens up, they through that gap quickly, they support really well. The thing I really love, and you talked about R R Richie Moonga, I'm pretty certain that Richie Moonga learns from each play. So you watch Crusaders play, they'll go through the first half, they make various plays, and they come out in the second half and bang. And so he's picked the, the inside defenders drifting, or um, they've been doing tips and they're coming in on the tips so they'll go in behind. And he just seems to do it every match. And so that, to me, is efficiency. Smithy, what would you like to see? I know that whenever you go out for dinner, you're always moving, <laughs> moving the salt and pepper shakers. Um, what would you like to see technically in the game at the moment evolve? I know we've had pods for a, year, a few years. We saw the, the Hurricanes come out and do something different. What would you like to see from a technical point of view? I think one of the things I've noticed since I got back from Kobe about five weeks ago is... Uh, as you say, everyone's, everyone's playing pods. So, you know, they'll have three forwards off, off the nine, for example. Um, but we, we seem to have become almost robotic, you know, um, going through the phases. And it'll be interesting to know, um, Tabs, wherever you are, how many phases does it take to, try, to score a try? I'm picking it's probably three or four phases. Most, probably 75% of your tries come from those three or four phases. So um, I'd like to see this be a bit more... Bit more efficient and effective off those, off those plays. And so, to me, like you get three, three guys coming forward off nine, for example, you hit the middle guy, the two guys on the outside are, are there to clean, no one's coming forward outside them for an offload, and it becomes a bit predictable. I'd like to see um, a, you know, an option or two outside that, that third guy, and I'd like to see those two guys, the actual options before they clean, and, uh, and be able to keep the ball alive a bit more. You talked about Highlanders, they know how to keep the ball alive. The parts of the game that aren't working for them, but they're beautiful to watch at times with their support play and their, their players arrive thinking they're going to get an offload before they, before they clean and then they clean. And I really enjoy that about them. Smithy, I've been out of the game too long. It's, that's, that stuff's gone way over my head at the moment. I'm not even, I've stopped listening. But, I mean, you are. You, you're a very intelligent man. You love, you know, analysing the game. How do you then go from high-class stuff, like the All Blacks and what you're speaking about now, to go into Japan and then, then implementing those things? Or do you change those things? Because you've been very successful over there as well in terms of what you've done with Corby Steel. I mean, what, what do you do? Do you do things differently there? Or do you, I mean, how do you, how do you, you know, implement the game plan there? Yeah, um, the game's different over there. Uh, if you watch um, Kobe play at the moment and see Brody Retallick, he's down to 117 kgs because he's, he's, he's got to be able to keep up with the uh, and, and he's magnificent. He is absolutely magnificent. Um, it's a faster game. Um, when I went there in 2018, I was sort of given the um, free reign, I suppose, to play the sort of game I always wanted a team to play. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we have a very attacking style. Um, you know, we, we put a lot of work into our support play. Um, we, don't, we don't get behind players very often with our pass. We go in front of them so that those players then can, can get an offload and keep the ball alive. Um, so it is, yeah, it is different. It's, it's really quick. Um, it's highly skilled, and it's, and it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun to, to be a part of. So much detail in the game, so much going on the field, and it's, it, it's, you can hear a pin drop here because people, people are trying to understand, one, first and foremost, what you're saying, but also the fact that the, the fact you have such a passion for it. But at the moment, there's a conversation going on, and it's starting here in New Zealand around the future of the game. And Kirsty's going to give us a bit of an update about what's happening this week as all of a sudden some major players, Kirsty, get around the table to talk about the future of our game.
Yes, there is trouble in paradise. Basically, a major standoff between the players or the voice that represents the players in New Zealand and New Zealand rugby. This, of course, is all about the 15% potential sale of New Zealand rugby, a commercial assets to an American technology company, Silver Lake Capital. Now, it's all very confusing. It's quite messy as well. I've tried to understand it, and it is extremely difficult. But basically, the Players Association have said they do not, they oppose the sale and now New Zealand Rugby, the Players Association, Super Rugby and the Provincial Unions are all meeting on Wednesday. Jeff, what do you think they're going to get out of that mediation? Well, they need to get a lot out of it and they need to come up with some solutions. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, the fact that these are challenging times and the numbers we're talking about are huge, Smithy. And I'm going to start with you. The fact that when all of these players are having a conversation, what do you, what's important to you that they are considering when you start talking about the future of our game? I'm like everyone else, I suppose. I feel a bit compromised here. Um, so I've got, a lot of, I've got a lot of time for Mark Robinson and Steve Lancaster, who are running this process from a New Zealand rugby union point of view. Got a lot of time for David Kirk and Rob Nicholl and the players, of course, who are, um, who are contesting the process. Um, I like Ian Kirkpatrick's group that are looking at something different around how to get more kids involved in the game, um, how to get more volunteers back in the game, how do we link with, with schools rugby. So I think it's a, it's a really difficult situation. Um, I like the fact I was on NZRPA um, call a couple of weeks ago, as you were, Jeff, and I like the fact that um, David Kirk and Rob Nicholl, whilst they're against uh, the New Zealand Rugby Players Association, whilst they're against the investment, at least they put up a couple of alternatives to, to raise the same sort of money. Um, all I know, though, is that we need the money. So <laughs> we, we, need, we need money to invest so that we're not just reliant on filling stadiums to, to keep the game going. Um, so somehow we need to, we need to get the capital, um, have the people with capability to, to invest that money to um, make sure that we've always got a fund there for the game and, and that um, a, a certain amount of that money goes to clubs community. We've got to start thinking about, we always ask about um, what, uh, why doesn't community come and support us? I think we've got to change the question and how do we help community? So what can we do for them? And I think that's the way to get them involved again. But all the volu most of the volunteers are my age or older now, so uh, you're going to have to have some money to, to get the right people in the right places, I think. Yeah, look, I think it's, it, it is, like Kerry said, it's complicated. So Silver Lakes wants to come in, they want to buy 15% the New Zealand Rugby Union are going to carve out the commercial rights, put it in a separate entity, and they believe to sell that for 10 or 15 per cent for 465 million. A lot of the older players believe that this money needs to be sent to, spent to invest in the grassroots and, and get that back healthy because it's unhealthy at the moment. I think the other thing that the New Zealand Rugby want to do with that money is secure the future financially. I think where the players are coming at it, they are concerned about selling off the commercial rights, which they are part of. So how do you recover that? The other thing that the players were concerned about is the expertise to grow that 465 million to a billion. So where are we going to get the expertise? They feel that sometimes it might be less as well. And when I say they, look, it's, it's Rob Nicholl and David Kirk at the moment. I think it's really important that the players are not going this week. So. Um, the only thing that concerns me, and I ask this question, how is the relationship? And everyone said, yeah, no, it's good, but then why would we go into to, to mitigation? I've never seen a good relationship go to mitigation. So that saddens me a wee bit. You know, we should be able to sort this out. Wayne's right, we need this, we need the money in the game at the moment, and so that needs to be resolved. I think that at the end of the day, the players need to be careful of one thing. The leadership of the NZRFU at some oh, NZU, you need to have faith that they're making the right decision for the game moving forward. And so I'm really hoping, as Smithy is, as we all are, that it's going to be sorted out on Wednesday because it's not good for the game. A mess from someone who's officially retired? No, nah, not yet. Not yet. So from a, from a <laughs> former not. professional player, are you still a former professional player? Is that the way? I was still getting paid, so... Oh, so he's not that either. <laughs> well, right. definitely need the money. From, from, you definitely need the money if you're still problem. getting paid. Uh, but from problem. someone who's well and truly has been inside the professional environment, as, as a player, you're looking at these discussions, and do you think that everyone's fully aware that how critical they are for the future of our game? I think everyone's aware how critical it is for the game. It's just a very complex 
thing. Like, I don't even have my head around it, and um, I'm probably not in a, in a good, good enough position to, to comment on it. Um, but I, what I do know, which is good, is that they are going to the table and, and have these tough discussions, because these tough discussions need to be had um, for the benefit of our game. And I think just for me, as long as they keep the grassroots strong, like a club like this, like Hotapu, like keeping our grass level strong, because that's where, at the end of the day, that's where the All Blacks come from. They come from grassroots, you come from your local primary school, whatever it may be. So as long as they keep that um, strong and thing, then New Zealand rugby or the All Black brand's always going to be strong. I mean, from my point of view, aren't we now in a place and a position to be able to evolve? And this is massive in terms of where our game is. You know, every year we, we sit in, you know, in the studio or talk, talk about things or we go on, on tour and what's the one thing everyone always talks about is the funding. There's not enough funding in, in our sort of grassroots um, you know, we, we struggle to get people to the games, we struggle to get registration. So aren't we, isn't that what we're actually needing? If we've, if we've had two independent reviews from, you know, very capable companies that are saying this is probably the best model, then, you know, is, isn't that looking like the way we, sh we should really go? Um, now, there are, the other, there, there is the other side of it too, you know, because we don't actually know where, what this money is actually going to. So when we say, you know, we're going to get collect $400 million dollars, well, we've got to make sure it's going, going somewhere, but we haven't got enough information in terms of that. Now, I under, totally understand where the Players Association are coming from. You know, they, they're uh, protecting where, um, you know, their investment and, and where, with, with their, the players and things. But I think uh, until we get sort of, you know, certainty in what's actually happen, ha happening, um, you know, we're, we're still going to be stuck in, in the same position. What I don't want is in, you know, three or four years' time, we're still in the same position, but probably worse because there's no money left over. And Smithy, that's important, right? When you start thinking about where we were 25 years ago, because that's when it started this professional game. But for us to have got to this point, we obviously haven't got something right, and things have changed, and we haven't adapted. And I mean, for you, have you got the confidence that they are the right people? Because the, the people you've talked about, the fact that they all care deeply about the game. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. There are a lot of people in this country that care deeply about it, whichever side of the fence they're on. I mean, this is all through a lot of the stuff going on at the moment. It's about passion, passion for the game. Um, what I do know is that there are 65 million All Black supporters worldwide and to monetise that, to, to actually get them to give us 10 bucks each would, would just about be enough. Um, but how do you do that without expertise? You know, that there's not the capability within the union at the moment to be able to do that. Um, so that, that's a big, big part of the equation for me. Yeah, look, I, I just hope that both parties realise that this is a critical moment. Um, Smithy and I are a bit older than you guys. You've been through a couple of them yourselves, but we've Did been that, through was, a few. Was that hard for you to say? Yeah, it was. <laughs> Good. But we've been through a few. You professionals, you, you guys have been through, and, and Goldie, you'll remember very well when the game was trying to be taken over by other media groups. You know, I think there's also a bigger picture at play here. The world game is up for grabs from a media point of view, so there's a lot going on. I come back to don't underestimate how important this is for our game and a key moment. We don't want to make the mistakes, so we need to sit down and make sure we make the right decision. And it needs to happen quick because they will take that check off the table. Right? And we will go in more depth when we get back in studio next week at Sky, give you more details as things go out. From my perspective, just quickly, is... is there are other players as well here. There are provincial unions, there are super rugby franchises, people who are invested in the game, and they need direction, they need help. We may need to make some sort of sacrifices together to get the best outcome. As always, Smithy, it's great to listen to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Good to listen to your day. And, Miss, you're a TV star now as well. We're playing, you're getting paid twice for playing a player and on television. Well done. Well done, you. Outstanding. Outstanding. Thanks, team. And let's go back to Kirsty. Thanks so much, Jeff. Coming up after the break, we have Blackburn, Chelsea Alley and new Chiefs women's recruit. Yes, historic announcement today. We will talk about that in a little bit. But don't forget Sky Rugby Club, the best preview show on the box. And make sure you check that out. Thursday night, Sky Sport 1. And who doesn't love a little bit of sibling rivalry? The Beauchere brothers from the Chiefs, they have it in spades. So what, are you going to try and smoke me or what? I'll give you a box if you put me over the over the fence on the full. Sweet, what if I do it twice? He loves telling this story. South Taranaki under 12s, I think. Caleb filled in, he would have been, what, eight? Yeah. Seven or eight? Yeah, seven or eight. I ended up getting my first ever 100. Pretty happy moment, and then um, we went and bowled, and 
Yeah, Caleb ended up getting a hat trick. <laughs> oh, that's good sound. Everyone, come in! The next week, the papers came around to the house and they didn't want to know about his under, they want to know about my hat trick. <laughs> so I think that's when he so he hung up the boots and said, stuff this, I'm playing ugly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yep. Yes. I played cricket in high school as well as rugby. Played CD reps, Central Districts, um, under 17 and 19. Um, played for Taranaki men's team. Was lucky enough to be able to play for New Zealand on the 19s. Into the attack. The, uh, New Zealand captain. Got him straight away. Just a little nip back up. And the New Zealand skipper strikes. I loved both sports just as much when I was at, um, when I was playing both. And rugby was just sort of just showed me a better pathway. Yeah, I just enjoyed rugby more. Yeah, went down that path pretty early and made it easy for me. Now Bosch airs into space. Wobbly up line side, flanker finishes off. So a great work from Lachlan Bosch over the ball. It could have been a different story. I could have been playing cricket, you know, but um, I want to stick with rugby and um, play for Taranaki and come here and hopefully get on the field with Lockie. Oh, I'm loving it, just learning off all the experienced guys and all the coaches, um, it's really cool. He's probably watched me and, yeah, can't really say I'd take too much credit for it. Sort of uh, does his own thing, I think. Yeah, I guess you do look up to your older brother when, when he's doing the same thing and when you're probably younger as well. We don't really do this affectionate type of stuff much, as you can tell. Yeah. So who got that box of beers? Probably me, was it? He didn't put me over the fence, I don't think, so... In the warm-up, eh? You didn't get that on camera, did you? of Super Rugby Aotearoa and another mixed bag for the New Zealand teams. Two impressive wins, but another two losses, which is becoming concerning. The first game was in Dunedin, and I thought I was watching an episode of Boom Has Gone Wild. They loved the big man. It's a big, powerful man. Big, powerful man from a big man. For a big man. Big man. For a big man. Big man. I love the big man. Oh, my heart was really going for it after that Chiefs game. Because ah! of that. Christian Cullen looked like he had front row tickets at a Wiggles concert. I think this guy must have got off a cruise ship about a year ago and has just been wandering around ever since. He was very lost. It was near riots in Hamilton as they just found out New World had discontinued the smeg knives. Otebi Black experimented with catching the ball with his face. Didn't work, but definitely worth a go. Oh, this is fun to do with Ioani's kicking stance. You can whack in a lightsaber. Or all manner of things, really. Novelty sides golf club, fish on a rod, dog on a leash, and a baseball bat. Accompanied by a pinata, of course. And finally, JK had a way too detailed analogy for it not to be true. It's a bit like the horrible neighbour, you know? You sort of get on, but then he starts burning his fire in your backyard and the smoke's coming over your house when you've got visitors. You sort of like them, but you don't really like them. Oi, JK's neighbour, take the hint. Stop burning your fire. That was off the ball this week. Oh, outstanding. <laughs> Did you really? No, that was the neighbours complaining about my pizza oven, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm great, that neighbour. <laughs> great to welcome on the show uh, Blackfern Chelsea. Ellie joins us. Give us a round of applause, please. Thank you. Great news today. Great news today. Exciting news. The fact we have a double header on May the 1st. It is the first time. The Chiefs and Blues women's sides are going head to head. How excited are you for that? And will there be a lot riding on it? And, and, and bragging rights, the Battle of the Bombays for you. How important? Yeah, um, I'm just hugely excited. It's always been a dream of mine to wear Chiefs colours. I think um, the last time I got given um, some Chiefs clothes to wear was, was back in the day when Liam was coaching me. Back in about 2011 for Varsity, I think he gave me a bit of his old Chiefs kit and um, I wore it around well, with pride. For nothing, so for nothing. He gave it to you for nothing. He probably left it on the sideline. I just knocked off with it. Nice. <laughs> He's still looking for it. Yeah, yeah, but, but to be given our own Chiefs kit now, you know, it's, a, it's pretty special. How does the selection work? So same as the Super, so you're picking amongst your franchise region? 
How does yep. that work? Yep, so um, the, the coaches in that from, there's a coach in, in each different region, Taranaki, um, Waikato, Bay of Pliny and Counties, and they, they've, they've had lengthy discussions about um, players who are on form in FPC, so it's, it's basically been picked off the back of the FPC, um, just the cream of the crop from each of the regions. So, yeah, we've had one training now, and I, I must say um, we're looking pretty sharp, so... How does that look in terms of the training, the training side of it? Because effectively, it's only one one game, so you build up. You guys come together, and, and is it basically more stuff on the field, or a lot of it off the field as well in terms of the weights training and things like that? Yeah, well, look, I think we all know um, um, the Chiefs men's team hold a lot of they've got a lot of mana about them, and um, we we thought it was just hugely important to get our culture side. Um, right first, so we've had a had a get together already, and a lot of time got put into um, our culture and our vision and that um, before we got out on the grass. And yeah, we, we we don't have a lot of time together yeah. before we play. Um, obviously, there's um, tough things to consider, like the amount of travel with the yeah. Taranaki girls and that. But um, yeah, when we're together, we've we've, um, we've we've set the ground rules and stuff, and. When we're out on the field, um, the level is really high, and man, the girls are just fizzing. We've been given some super cool purple Chiefs training jerseys, so we think we look pretty sharp. And, nice. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about them. Is this the real hope for bigger things to come? That you can get that national competition you're looking for? Yeah, definitely. Like I think the super super rugby is the natural pro progression for women's. Um, if you've followed the Farah Palmer Cup over the last few years, you would see that the level has just growing immensely and I think you know just to bridge that gap between FPC and, and Black Ferns now um, having a super rugby competition is just the natural thing. Kirsty, we'll have a, uh, a question from the crowd please. Yes I've managed to find Jade I've convinced you to do this even though you probably don't want to uh, but what do you have to do with women's rugby at Hotapu? Um, I started up the women's rugby team last year first year of it so um, it was pretty cool. Got 17 girls play their first ever game of rugby last year and we won it, the first game. So it was a pretty cool achievement and Hotapu Rugby Club's pretty cool to be growing the women's game as well. That's amazing. That deserves a round of applause, doesn't it? <laughs> well done and congratulations, Jade. Now you've got a question for our panel as well, don't you? I do. Um, does the women game get the recognition that it deserves? I think that's for you, Charles. Thanks, Jade. I've actually um, coached and played alongside Jade as well, so good to see you. Um, does the women's game get the recognition it deserves? I think um, if I look um, throughout my career, um, where it started 10 years ago when I first started playing club rugby to now, there's been a massive, massive growth um, in the recognition we get and obviously with contracts and stuff now. Um, but in saying that, um, to be really honest, there's still a long way to go, I think. We do deserve more recognition than we currently get, and I'm quite happy to say that honestly. But um, yeah, so we've come a long well, way, but a long way to go. Oh, absolutely, and, and because you're inside it and you know it, then you believe it, and, and that's honest. I mean, that's all we can ask of you. And the fact that there is an investment going into the game, and I'm hoping, and I'm sure there will be, the women's game is going to benefit from that because the game is growing so much. The tipping comp. This is not a great week for me. Chelsea, JK, this is not a great week. Let's have a look at the leaderboard. And the breakdown leaderboard tells me that I got absolutely no points last week. <laughs> the Highlanders and the Blues. Yep, I got no points. Kirsty's leading. She's come back onto the show and all of a sudden she's showing off. <laughs> not that you guys did that much better. Not that much better. Um, not a bad week for you though, JK. It's how do I get two points? I'm not sure how you got two points either. And there, Kirsty's on top, Justin Marshall. Tony Johnson, how did you get three points on top? What? On top. No, no, this is... Well, she is on the second best show on Sky. Um, a rugby show. No, she's a premium show. Anyway, look, uh, Tabai's got a lot of work to do for an analyst, but I'll tell you, we've got tickets to give away for this uh, weekend, for both games, and they're going to be great contests. You should look at that. Make sure you join, uh, email us on the breakdown at sky.co.nz. As well as that, you've got a couple of days left uh, to register your under 85 kg team in a national competition. So make sure this New Zealand Barbarians under 85 Club Cup competition. Two days left. It's going to be massive. The final last year was at Auckland and it was an outstanding contest. Make sure uh, you get involved with that if you're a club. I'm pretty sure this club's got a team in that, haven't you? I think you're trying to do your best. You've got a couple of days to get it going. All right, Kirsty, let's go back to you. 
Thanks so much, Steph. And yes, maybe if you and Mills pick the Chiefs, then you'd be on top, maybe, just maybe. Now, she doesn't know that we're doing this, but we've got a Sky Sport Month pass to give away for Sky Sport now. Thank you so much, Jade, for your question, and thank you so much for all your hard work in the women's rugby space. So that's for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So we've got a massive weekend coming up for us. You think about the Crusaders taking on the Highlanders. Cause does anyone here see the Highlanders winning? If anyone's going to beat them, it's Highlanders. I said that before. The, the, the Highlanders are the Crusaders' bogey team. Are they going to? Yes. Whoa. And okay. they're going to. Chelsea, do you believe any of that? Um, judging on recent form, i will probably have to say no. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier on the show to disagree with JK. Yeah. That's where we find it uh, all the time. Uh, the Blues take on the Hurricanes. Mm. That's at Eden Park. Oh, that's a big one, yeah, That's it? a massive one. Things have changed, right? Now, this is a different Hurricanes team. You know, the way they performed on the weekend. And we're seeing what confidence can do to a team as well, the Chiefs. But oh, it's a great chance now for the Blues to get, get up. Oh, I still believe that they've got a big forward pick and they'll come out and win. But when you're right <laughs> up against Geordie Barrett show, JK... Hurricanes for you? Well, hold on. <sighs> He's just talked about form, right? So form tells us. Yeah, just don't give him the ball. Don't kick him the ball. Keep the ball in hand and kick it out. Do not give Geordie the ball and stay clean from a penalty point of view. And if we get a penalty in there, 22, kick it. Chelsea, this is why he's not coaching the Blues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is not what happens. How do you see that one playing out? Um, look, I really enjoyed watching the Canes on the weekend. I thought they were outstanding. Um, but I was also just this morning at the Blues HQ and I saw those boys in the gym and there were a few comments thrown around that, you know, they were angry and they were, like, they were keen to get up and, and I could see it in the way they were training. So I think it's, it's going to be a great match. So you've picked no one? <laughs> Pick no one. And on that note, congratulations, well done. Thank you very much for coming on the show. That's how we do things. Thank you so much for Wayne Smith, as always, Liam Messam as well. The Hautapu Rugby Club, thank you very much. And for all the clubs that have supported us, we'll see you back in studio next week. Such a big game for both of these teams. Toki Aho, thundering downfield. Big white wall coming up, but he's busted the tackles. It's for Christie's got it. Here's Barrett, Barrett, Barrett still on his feet, Barrett's on! Great tackle, Damian McKenzie! Ray Arcee slips it to Barrett, Johnny Barrett does it again! Robinson thundering through, Robinson, oh can he go all the way? He does, what a try from the big red! Barrett, oh boy, he's got a hat trick! The respect shown to the one and only Aaron Smith. McKenzie, he scores! Oh, what a try!